Welcome to a special edition of the CK Podcast. I'm your host, Leo Biaz, and today we have a very special guest, the starting center of your Sacramento Kings, Rashawn Holmes. How you doing, brother? Oh, man, doing good, doing good, man. Appreciate the intro. Appreciate the time, you know, uh, man, looking forward to today. Hey, man, thank you, bro. I just saw that no you gave your father a brand new Audi SUV. Talk yeah, about... Yeah what that feels like as a son giving such a significant present to the father right that helped you grow as a man as a child he was there for your biggest moments and your lowest moments mm-hmm. how rectifying did that feel for you oh man it was, it was dope one of the best feelings i could possibly ask for you know to just be able to give him something you know that i know he wanted you know what i'm saying <laughs> something i know he wanted and uh you know, just like you said, he's been there through seeing my lowest moments, been there to pick me up, you know, been there to drive me to all the practices, all the AAU tournaments, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, just wanted to kind of just, you know, give him a little gift in return, you know, just show him that I love him. And, uh, you know, it felt amazing to be able to do that. So definitely very blessed to be able to do that. It was amazing. His reaction was everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was. It was, was so crazy. crazy. Especially because yeah. we kind of know him from doing some stuff at Buckhorn and, Knowing how animated he was and just seeing his raw reaction was just it was it was it was awesome. It was just unbelievable, man. So again, oh, congratulations yeah. on that. It was, that's that's big time. Oh yeah, no doubt, man. Appreciate that. Appreciate that for sure. Happy birthday to Pops again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so on this show today we'll be talking about your overall season, your bubble experience. Uh, we'll break down some film, not too much, uh, pretty basic stuff, and then your experience with Kings fans your life uh, with Christ, your faith, and then Mm -hmm. your business acumen, stuff that you're getting into, and the type of things that you're working on your game to elevate it to the next level. Now that you've had a few months to think about the entire season, what do you think you would have changed? What was your biggest challenge for the team and yourself? Um, I think for the for the team, I think, you know, just like that slow start we got off to, you know, we got off to kind of a slow start. And uh, I think if we could have just came out and hit the ground running, you know, like playing with the same rhythm we had later on in the season, you know, it could have been we could have really did something special. So I think but it's not a learning experience. And I think it's it's something that's kind of on our minds now. We want to make sure that we're doing the work that we need to do in the off season, so we can kind of come out and hit the ground running. So, yeah, I think uh, for the team, that's that definitely was tough to start off that slow. And uh, for me personally, man, it was a shoulder injury, like, you know, the be kind of in the rhythm playing kind of well and then have to miss so many games right. and everything that happened when I did come back, you know, it was definitely kind of tough, you know, to just sit there and watch, but you know what I'm saying? It's something new, something different. Yeah. Able to see the game from a different perspective, you know, uh, so mentally I feel like I grew a little bit even in that. What did you learn when you were on the bench watching all those games, knowing that your team needed you out there, especially defensively, and just opening up the floor from a pick and roll perspective? What did you really learn from just watching it on the bench? I think just like seeing different places where I could be more effective, you know, seeing, you know, where I could move the ball quick here or set a screen, set more random screens here and being tra- a lot of a lot of it was in transition, really just setting random screens, places where I could set a random screen, get somebody open. You know, buddy coming off the wing, coming off, getting an open three, you know, quick shot to change momentum. Just little things like that, you know, I would just pick up on and working on now, you know, just making sure that, you know, I had it in my repertoire. So walk me through the bubble experience and give the fans a day to day on what you would do. Day to day. So, yeah, when you first wake up, the first thing you're doing is you got to take your temperature and your oxygen saturation levels and so yeah, two things crazy. you got to get plugged into the computer right away so uh you make sure you check in logged in and then you got a you got a testing time so your testing time is either before or after practice and most of the time it was before for us and so uh we would go down test breakfast usually practice the whole time around the campus you're wearing masks and everything and, uh, yeah, you go to practice, come back. They have food set up for you. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was very very smooth, but you definitely couldn't have contact with anybody from yeah. the outside world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but the the way the NBA did it and the way they set it up to make sure everybody was safe down there, I mean, it was it was really amazing to see. Were you shocked that the Lakers won the NBA championship, or did you really expect that? I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't shocked. You know, uh, I was more shocked that the Clippers lost. Yeah, honestly. me too. <laughs> but, you know what I'm saying? But no, nah, I was. Uh, no, nah, it wasn't shocking to see. You know, they had the team for it, great players over there. So, you know, definitely could see it coming. Now, before we get into some of these game clips uh, that I've chosen to highlight. Can you give some clarity on your guys' defensive philosophy from a schematic standpoint? For example, did you guys always try and guard a pick and roll the same way, or did that depend on the opponent? I know it always depends on the opponent. Like, which guard you have coming off, uh, the big that's setting it, if he likes to pop, roll, you know, mid post, things of that sort. So the game plan kind of switched, like, with every, with every play, uh, team we played against. But was there a specific philosophy from a schematic standpoint that the coaches uh, would really like would count on? Base scheme would kind of try to just stay between the men and the ball. Like, okay. So if I'm guarding the pick and roll, right? Then my job as the big would be to kind of hedge it, make the offensive player slow down a little bit so my man can get back. But why not let my man get behind me? So that would kind of be the base scheme, I would say. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. Because uh, obviously on this first clip, right, where – and it's always hard to have some context. It's really hard to guard these great guards, right, like the Lucas, mm-hmm. the, the James Hardens of the world, uh, especially guys who can shoot. And then they're such a, a weapon when it comes to passing the ball as well, and their IQ is super high. So it makes life a lot more difficult on defenses. But even on this first play, Harrison Bournes – guarding Luca and then Luca goes pretty much into you. You're you're essentially helping on this play, which is good. But as I pinpointed on this play, Bielitsa is pretty much in no man's land. There was no need for him to to really help out because you you were doing your job and on the weak side helping out. And then that leaves two other guys open on that play, which again, I love my guy Belly. That's my guy, but a lot of the times and in this game specifically he did this three times where he would overhelp for really no reason and you would have open guys like this. So from your perspective, when you see stuff like this, and I'm sure the coach is really specifying just hound you guys on this during film session, but you being the most consistent defender on this team, is there any type of advice that you would give your teammates and were they receptive to it? Uh, most definitely. I mean, we, we, we would talk a lot, you know, before after games about defensive schemes and things like that and you know a lot of times guys just get caught ball watching you know it's just right. you know it happens more than it really should you know you watch the ball you naturally want to sink down you know yep. try to get support try to get help make sure your teammates not getting beat and you know belly that's always his mindset belly is going try to be there to help if he can you know even if he if somebody's there you know belly wants to make sure that you know the fire is put out and so uh, for me, it's just it's about trust. You know, we we learned we started learning how to trust each other, and as we went along, you know, that trust got stronger. So on plays like that, Belly would kind of know I got it. You know, I'm here, and you know he would rotate somewhere else. So you know what I'm saying? It's more just about communication and just talking while we're on the floor. And how do you improve that communication? What type of things can you guys really do? Is it just a game to game thing? Um, is it just you knowing what the other team will do from an IQ standpoint? and just predicting what that will be? Or, I mean, it's just hard for, like, a fan to to really see uh, you guys have all these mental lapses as a team so often. You know, it's frustrating. It's frustrating for the fans, and I'm sure it's more frustrating for you guys watching that, not just in, in film session, but just living it, like, during the game. Like, what can you really do to not have so many mental lapses defensively? I mean, it's a, common, it's a combination of things, you know. It's... Uh... You know, we had a scouting report. We try to keep things according to the scouting report, but the NBA players are going to improvise. And so, like I said, a lot of it is just communication and building that trust, just getting used to each other and getting understanding, you know, where guys are going to be on the floor, guys knowing exactly where to go and things of that sort, and just building that trust for real. Like, you look at teams like the Trailblazers. They've mm-hmm. been together for years, you know what I'm saying? And 
You yeah. can kind of see when they play. They know where each other's going to be. They know exactly when somebody's going to rotate and things of that sort. They've been playing with each other for so long. So I think just the longer we play together, the more that it build. So on the second play, you guys are in transition. It's pretty much four on four at this point. I've always said this. If you put a guard in a position to communicate, like say even in a Spain pick and roll, which they did that earlier in the game to you where Buddy's man, I think it was Tim Hardaway. There was an, an initial screen, you switched to it, and then his guy went to screen you, and then there was no communication, and the roll was wide open. So to me, it's like all guards who are put in situations to, to communicate, it's probably not going to end up well. And on this play, De'Aaron Fox turns his head for a little bit, and then they just back cut him, and they just... Uh, get a wide open layup the end one what could you guys have done differently here as a team it's really tough like it's really tough to say because like when you look in that film like you can say like you know you got you just got to be more aware like it's awareness yeah. and like i say it's communication and things of that sort but you know uh when you're on the court you know it's about having a feel like just having that feel and knowing like what's about to happen, kind of having like an anti, like you said, anticipation and things of that sort. So I feel like on plays like that, there's things where we have to anticipate what's going to happen. Like it's got to be more anticipation instead of just waiting for the offense to bring the pressure to us. You know what I'm saying? Like so, so, so. Do yeah. you watch a lot of film yourself? Because I feel like your anticipation is really, really good. How do yeah. you, um, in some way, teach that to someone who isn't good at that? That makes sense. I mean, I feel like that's just comes with playing. Like okay. I'm going into like my my sixth year now, and like that's something people would say I really struggled with in my early years while I was playing in Philly. You know what I'm saying? That's there's a lot of things that comes with playing, it comes with experience, and comes with just understand like being in the situation before, having messed up a situation like that before, and understanding how to come back and what to do next time you're in that situation. So like. My brothers would always say, like, experience is the best teacher. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not something I can really, you can really say until somebody's been in that situation. Okay. So on this third play, I like this play defensively, even though uh, they scored on this play. But on, on this specific one, you guys rotated the right way. You guys communicated the right way. You hedged and you were pretty much playing good uh, defense right there. The Mavericks had one of the best offenses in the NBA almost ever. And mm -hmm. they they move well without the ball. And on, on this play, obviously, they drive and they kick. Uh, Bays stays down, which which I think is one of your best attributes, is that you don't really bite on fakes. And I feel like that's part of you watching a lot of film and you having experience. But a lot of the guards on the team really bite. And, and you know, that's really, like, something that bothers me. But I'm sure it bothers your, head, it bothers your coaches. How do you as a teammate, you know, tell tell your teammates just stay down? The worst thing they can do is just shoot that shot and you just contest. What do you think it is that that just makes them want to just bite on those shot fakes? Even on guys like Rondo who are not good three-point shooters. Yeah, it's just like jittery, man. Like that's the <laughs> best way I could I could put it. Like But you're you so know, good at it. I mean, you you hardly ever ever bite on that. Yeah, like I but like I said, I used to bite on a lot of okay. fakes, especially <laughs> early on. Like it's like it's jittery. You want to you playing defense, especially like at the end of the shot clock. You playing good defense, man. You trying to force up a bad shot. You want to get the block. You want to get the steal. Like it's, it's different. Like it's a lot of jitters that goes on. You know what I'm saying? But that's okay. like the number one main thing you can't do is is bite on the pump face, yeah. especially in the NBA today. Like if you bite on the pump face, it's you're over. Dead. Like <laughs> so, like that's just that's something you got to get discipline on. Like you just got to have discipline on it. Just jump straight up off the ground, second off the ground. You know, just that's something we always say, second off the ground. It's something we're trying to drill and make sure we understand now. Just contest. You know, these are NBA players. Just, you know, it's a make or miss lead. You know, just try to make it as tough as you can. But exactly. Oh, exactly. And, and on this play, you made it as tough as you could. You contested that, that floater. He made the shot. I always say this. Yeah. Everybody yeah. in the NBA can score the ball. They're professional scorers. Definitely. So, you know, I, that's what I'm saying. Where on, on this specific possession, you guys played it well and they just scored the ball. So tip your hat off to them, right? Yeah, you got it. You got to live with that. If you make every possession a shot like that, then I like the chance to live with Exactly. I agree. So on this last possession before we end this little mini film session, it was my favorite play of, of, of all year, especially for you. You just guarded and you, and you switched on to Donovan Mitchell just so well. You didn't bite. Uh, 
you stay down. That's a lot of discipline, especially with the game on the line. So congrats on that. But take me through that play. I just knew it was like uh, I knew for one, it was only a few seconds left. I can't remember. Was it was it three? Like yeah. two or three seconds left, something like that. Two point nine. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I knew he has enough time, like usually for like you can get two, three dribbles off. And usually it's going to be a pump fake at the end. Yeah. <laughs> And so I just wanted to make sure I didn't foul him. Like, just try to stay in front of him, keep him going sideways. As soon as I switched out and just wanted to keep him going sideways, not towards the rim, didn't want to give him any rhythm for a good shot and just make sure I did not foul him. I didn't want to make it easy on him by fouling him. And we was able to get the stop. <laughs> we was able to get the stop. So that was... That was oh man, that was a good win. Still, how much still, film no. and, and this, this is a testament to your you know greatness on defense. How much film do you watch on a day to day? Like you guys practice, and then obviously there are certain guys that will put in the extra work. How much film do you, on the average, watch on other defenses? Oh, I watch a lot of film. I mean, uh, the assistant coaches always like they had a laptop full of like they did a great job of keeping us prepared and things like that. And if we ever needed anything extra, like always can just ask. Like and the assistant coach Roy, Roy Rayner, he used to have he was my he was my coach and he okay. would have all the film, he would have it organized. If I needed to watch one thing this day, let me watch what I need to do on the hedge or watch what I need to do on the drop different coverages, things of that sort, or what is what is this guy's tendency? What does he like to do? And things of that sort. Like, he had everything organized, everything ready to go, and we can just have a film session whenever. So it, it made it even easier to be able to watch film like that because it was so accessible. Right on. You guys have a new front office. Have you had a chance to talk to, to Monte? I did. I got a chance to meet him, uh, I think it was last week, when we uh, I was down there training with a few guys and got to meet him last week. Super cool dude. Mm -hmm. Look forward to working. Have you had experience with him before or was it the first time meeting him? Uh, That was was my first time meeting him. That was my first time meeting him. Uh, I think it was, I want want to say two weeks ago, I believe. Without giving details, a good conversation about, you know, your role moving forward? Oh yeah, no, we definitely, uh, we had a couple conversations over the phone. So we've been in like communication and things of that sort. And, you know, got a chance to meet in person. So, yeah, he's, you know, he, he's focused and he, he knows what he wants to do. And like I said, looking forward to it, looking forward to it. You've been on multiple teams now in your career. Uh, have you seen a major difference in the fan bases that you've played for? Uh, Yeah, I think uh, I think every fan base has like its own kind of style. Like every city has its own style. You know what I'm saying? Anything special about this fan base? This fan base, I think just the genuine love that they show, like, regardless of how you plan, like, I could have had one of my worst games. Yeah. And the love is going to be genuine and real. Like, it's always trying to pick you up. Like, they always try to pick us up, even when we started off slow, things of that sort, with the frustration. Like, the fan base always is trying to pick us up, man. That's something I definitely love about Sacramento. Like the love is just so it's so genuine. Absolutely. I, yeah. I love this fan base, man. I've been a Kings fan and you know, luckily I've been blessed to cover the team professionally. But I grew up a Kings fan and my first game was in 05, a playoff game. And that was really pretty much mm-hmm. the second to last time when, when they made the playoffs. Uh, so it's been a long time. Uh, and you know, I'm hoping that you guys do make the playoffs soon. Is that in the back of your is, is, is that in the back of your guys' minds, thinking like, "Hey, man, we have to just end this drought." Ah, uh, man, that's all we think about. <laughs> that's all we think about. You know, is that's all we want to do is just get a chance to you know get into that into playing real basketball, that real basketball when it matters, and things of that sort. You know, to get those fans a chance to cheer us on in the seven game series. You know, right. Like, I, I think about Sacramento fans like back in the day, like the Cowbells and all that, yeah. like, especially the Web and those guys. I think about those days and things of that sort, and just to get those fans a chance to, you know, like get in those arenas, you know, God willing, everything goes back to normal, you know what I'm saying? And just get the fans a chance to get back and, you know, show that love, just show that love on a national scale and things of that sort. You know, that's all we think about. 
It's a perfect transition to talk about the pandemic, local businesses. I'm at a local business now here. I'm in DC, Sacramento, right across the Golden One Center. So if you guys can please continue and support your local businesses during these hard times, uh, we would really appreciate it. So shout out to Medici Sacramento for having us host the CK podcast here. Rashawn, we're we're living in a pandemic now, seeing all the challenges it may bring, like mental health issues, financial problems, obviously the virus, etc. How has your faith helped you get through it? Oh man, faith is it's been everything. You know, just is like mentally, I think just the things that can go through people's minds in general, like, you know, the thoughts you have, things of that sort, you know, it can it can kind of make you fearful, you know, it can try to bring fear, you get afraid, don't know what the future holds and things of that sort, and just having that to lean on, having God to lean on, to go back to my scriptures, to calm my spirit and things of that sort, and just keep me level-headed and, you know, understand what the what the bigger picture is, I feel like. That's been everything, you know, it just has kept me, like I said, kept me grounded, kept me humble and, uh, you know, helped me understand that, you know, things are going to be good. I've seen some of your lives with a lot of pastors around the country. How have mm. those been and, and how has those relationships helped you solidify your faith in Christ? Oh, man, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. And I think just... Being able to talk to those men of God and, you know, pick their brains, you know, such great men of God who studied the word like countless hours and things of that sort, you know, to be able to pick their brain and, you know, get some inspiration, some motivation from guys like that. You know, we all need our spirits fed. You know, we need, you know, to get stronger, things of that sort. And just by hearing it and, like I said, picking their brains, you know, it was I, I can't really under understate too much, like how much that helped me and how much that that helped a lot of people, you know, just hearing the word from those men. So it was it was amazing to do. It. And like, I, I really don't take that lightly, you know, them coming on to talk to me for the people, you know, I really don't take it lightly. And it was it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. What are some of the things or tools that you use, say, like an app or even the Bible itself? to really start your day, meditate, because I like to listen to a lot of videos on YouTube. That's one of the things that I like to do in the mornings. Are mm-hmm. there anything specific that you do? I mean, I have my Bible app. You know, I got on the Bible app, things of that sort. My uh, my dad does, he teaches on Instagram Live. He does it probably three, four times a week, and I try to catch all of those. And uh, But for the most part, on the day-to-day, I have my devotional do my thing. I read the read the scripture of the day. Anything I'm feeling, I read. You know, any problems I feel like I'm having, you know, I try to find a scripture that relates to those problems. But uh, yeah, this 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 phone and technology, man, <laughs> something for me. So there's no excuses for us not to get closer to God, right? Oh yeah, no doubt, no doubt, definitely. All excuses have been eliminated. Exactly. You know, you're entering in in this new phase of your life where. You're just not a basketball player. Uh, you're a Christian first and foremost, but you're entering a new phase in business. You're investing in certain things. Talk about what type of things you're investing on and, and what things interest you outside of basketball. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, right now I've got my State 22 Foundation now, and um, we're actually investing in what we call the underdogs, underdogs, you know, trying to get them – because for me, it's never really been about, you know, the money I make off the court. It's always about the impact I make. And right. so I'm always just trying to make an impact and just investing in young men who kind of overlooked, who got the talent to make it, got the talent to play at the college level, things of that sort. And, you know, just overlooked, kind of like I was. You know what I'm saying? I was didn't have offers coming out of high school. So that was always what my heart was when uh, talking about what to invest in, I want to always invest in the community and invest in my in the underdogs like that. That's awesome. And I I also hear that you invested in humanly. Is that accurate? Oh yeah, yeah. We are. We working we are working with them. We are working with them. Still looking at some things now, but I mean it 
sounds amazing. Like it yeah. sounds amazing. So I'm definitely looking so forward I'll, to it. So to I'll, I'll give uh, some people some cliff notes about them. It's artificial intelligence that allows recruiters and applicants to be better paired together that removes bias from job postings and gives everyone an equal opportunity to get the job. And in today's political climate, that's big time. So I applaud you for investing in in such a progressive minded forward thinking company like them anything else that you'd like to add to that no nah, like, like you said it, uh i feel like it just evens the playing field you know especially now yeah. it gives more people opportunity who wouldn't have that opportunity before it's something i definitely believe in and uh like i said i'm looking forward to things in the future and looking forward to you know more people getting on board sounds good what part of your game do you think you need to improve on the most to take it to the next level I think two things, just uh, being able to space the floor and knock down the three is something that's huge. It's something I've done before in my career. You know, mm-hmm. it's just, you know, roles change. And uh, I think this year is going to be the year where I'm able to shoot the ball a little bit more and step out. So that's something I've definitely been working on, passing out of the short roll. You know, who's have things I can always get to the rim, but just being able to make that extra pass and being able to make it quickly and like swiftly and on time. Another thing we've been working on. So I think those two things really changed the dynamic and uh, the type of player I am. I want to be respectful for your time. So one last question. What has been your funniest NBA story ever? Funniest NBA story ever. Oh, I got a lot of them. Trying to see which one I can say on air. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Funniest one. Well, actually, this past year, uh, this year, I uh, you know Joel and B. That's my that's my guy. He played for a while. Yeah. Uh, he came out and he dunked on me. I think like it was like the first play of the game. We played them in Philly, and uh, just the the trash he was talking <laughs> kind of after was just you know he he's a hilarious guy. And so, I've heard so, like. <laughs> The trash he was talking, but then at the same time he was showing he was showing love at the same time, and I just it was really funny. Like he's a, he's a funny guy. That's that's something I can think of offhand. But I I mean I got a lot of them. I just can't. I can't is say he the it. big? Is he the biggest trash talker in the NBA? Um, he's one of them. He's one of them. I know uh, Kevin Durant is too. Really? He, yeah, he he talks. <laughs> he 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 lets. He lets it be known who he is. <laughs> okay. So who's your top known, five? Bro. Top five biggest trash talkers. My top five. Uh definitely put Joel in there. Definitely put KD in there. Um Marcus Smart talk or nah? Marcus Smart, he does nah, he doesn't really talk too much. He doesn't really talk too much. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, who's really who's really a talker like that? Who's the biggest trash talker on your team? <laughs> on the team, it's probably Buddy. Buddy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I say it's Buddy on the team. Oh, between man. Buddy and Bogey. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, between Buddy and Bogey, yeah, they they go at it. They go at it. Okay. But uh, NBA-wise, I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends, though, because a lot of guys don't just come out and chirp. Like, like, I'm used to, like, the Kevin Garnett type trash talk. Okay. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of how I grew up. So it's not really, it's not too much like that. It's mostly guys just hyping themselves up. Like they usually don't talk, not talking too much at you. Like, but it's more like just hyping. They say, this guy can't guard me or he can't check me. Like with Kevin Durant, that's what it is a lot. Like, just he, this guy can't guard me. And he'd be right a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't lying. No lies yeah. detected, huh? <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, what type of things are you working on right now? I know you're in LA with your son, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. What what type of projects do you have in the upcoming future? Man, we got a lot of things coming. We got a uh, clothing, looking at clothing lines. Got a uh, Stay Twenty Two merch on the way. Send that merch over, bro. Uh, <laughs> Say it again. Send that merch over, man. <laughs> oh yeah, no, nah, no doubt, no doubt. So yeah, we got a lot of Stay Twenty Two merch coming. We got to uh, might try to get into a little modeling, you know what I'm saying? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, nah, modeling, acting, things of that sort, just trying to diversify, 
you know, looking to get my hand in different things. So uh, there's a lot of things I'm interested in right now. So, but yeah, that merch is definitely on the way. You never know. You might, you might see me in the next movie. <laughs> there it is, guys. We appreciate your time. If you guys can drop a review on iTunes or a rating, hit that like button, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you guys so much. You guys can follow Rashawn Holmes on all social media platforms as well. Also, his uh, company, Stay Tuned. Lots of good things coming, Kings For fans. Sure. Be patient. Be patient. We know it's been a long, long time since they've made the playoffs. Rashawn and Co and company, they're trying their hardest to end the drought. Uh, I can testify oh, yeah. to that, Definitely. man. Uh, so Definitely. on behalf on behalf of the entire CK family, we thank you guys, and we'll see you guys on the next one. God bless. Appreciate it.